Yeah, we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 9. This is our part two of the four-part uh, series, and we'll be in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to 38. Uh, you hear, uh, have heard all about it a hundred times, but there's a number of things we need to look at. Uh, we we're talking about the harvest and the need of the harvest, but now we're going to spend a little time talking about the urgency of the harvest. And that's very important, is that, well, yep, we need to send out our missionaries. We need to do what we need to do. But if there's no urgency, there's a real good chance that we just kind of slough it off. Uh, there are people this second dying in this world without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on their way to eternity separated from God forever. And no way of fixing that. It's eternally too late for them. It's urgent that we get the gospel out. Now, it's our responsibility to go to our neighbors and our family and our friends, to, to our Jerusalem and Judea, but where we can't go to the other most parts of the earth, we need to send others. They have a sense of urgency, but we need to share their sense of urgency. And that's where I'm going to try and help us uh, see today, because we don't see it as much for most of us in America who we really got it pretty easy. Even those that struggle is better than what many countries are today. Just think of the folks in Ukraine who've lost everything. And yet, many Christians there uh, are still going on for the Lord. But there are many that need to be saved, and many that might die right now as I'm speaking because of the war that's going on. Uh, there's a great need. There's a great urgency. And we need to keep that in mind as we pray for what the Lord would have us to do. So in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to 38, you probably all have it memorized by now, but you're going to hear it a few more times. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. I always love to read those words because our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is filled with compassion. He's a God of compassion. He cares about us in ways that we can't even comprehend. He loves us so much more deeply than we can ever understand. Because our love is generally a pretty surface love, but his is a love that's deeper than deep. And because of that, even though many had rejected him, he was moved with compassion. His heart was stirred for those because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. There are many today that are fainting, many that are scattered without a shepherd. It's our job personally, it's our job as sending out missionaries to fulfill that need, that they don't have to faint, and that they can have a shepherd who will take care of them and always guide and direct them, uh, at least when they're obedient. Sheep have a tendency not to be very obedient. They're dumb critters. And that's why God calls us sheep. We deserve that title. <clears throat> and then verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send you into his harvest. Uh, I, I'm sorry, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. I had to throw that in to keep reminding us it's not about just sending others, though we need to do that, and we need to send more. We need to take on more missionaries. Uh, we're out of time. The Lord is coming soon, and there is a great urgency, greater than we know, um, but that doesn't negate our responsibility to be part of those laborers. And so, as I have already spoken much about the harvest, we see in our text that Jesus is teaching a very important spiritual truth using something with which we can easily relate to, a harvest, a gathering in of crops. But Jesus is speaking in of a gathering of souls and not crops. When's the last time you looked at someone as a soul and a soul that's lost? and a soul that needs to be found through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We see each other as human beings. We see each other as um, 
people in need in general. But we don't see people with eternal souls that without Christ will be separated from him forever and no opportunity to be redeemed. If we would, our hearts would be broken and we wouldn't have a Mission Emphasis Month because we'd all already be like our Savior, people of compassion, because we recognize and understand the urgency of the need. And Jesus is speaking of these gatherings of these souls, and again, not of crops. He's trying to draw a relationship so that they could understand and that we can understand. Uh, And it's not so easy for teaching spiritual truths. Water, light, and mustard seed, and figs, and pigs, and sheep, etc. God uses all of those things to help us to understand. We may not know about crops, but we know something about pigs. We may not know something about pigs, but we know something about mustard seeds. He uses things, illustrations, so that they would understand, and that we too then can understand the great need. But the multitudes had gathered themselves around him, and he looked upon them, and he saw their great spiritual need. We sing a song about um, people need the Lord. He knew that. He knew their hearts. He knew their minds. It broke his heart. And he had compassion on them. He understood the urgency that was going on. And we need to get to that place in our own lives. He said that they fainted. They were growing weary. They were without strength. They themselves, as we were singing about, falling on our knees for strength. And uh, uh, they weren't on their knees. They were going about their business doing what they do, which is like most human beings. But he could see through all of that and go on, these people are in great need. And his heart was broken. And he had compassion. And it wasn't just a feeling so the words can be said, but his compassion led to action. And if you ever think about it, True compassion always leads to action, or it was never compassion to begin with. Compassion, if it's just a word, it's like sympathy. We can have sympathy for someone, really, and nothing comes out of it. I really sympathize with them. What are we saying? Oh, we really don't care. But when you have compassion, that means you're going to do something about it. Our Savior did something about it. He died for us. He bore our sins on the cross at Calvary that we might be redeemed and reconciled back to God that we can be with him forever in heaven. He did something because of his compassion. I'm trying to be more careful when I use that word myself because it then I'm going to be held accountable because I'm telling God I have compassion on them. And then if I don't do anything, all I'm saying is, boy, I feel real bad about him. Well, it goes beyond that. And Jesus was that way. And these people, they had fainted. They had grown weary. They were without strength. They were like scattered sheep without a shepherd. I had a friend once tell me he had just moved to New Mexico. And he he was from New York City. So he didn't understand much about farms and things like that. He hadn't been around sheep other than he was raised with us people as sheep. But he looked out his back window and there was a Uh, a flock of sheep running around. He said, boy, they were the dumbest things I ever saw, how they were acting and the shepherd wasn't there and they were getting into all kinds of trouble and they were going all kinds of different directions. Uh, that's, That's people. That's us. And they'll run themselves in circles. They'll get themselves in all kinds of trouble. They'll get so, um, they'll become weary that they'll kill themselves. They'll get into the, into the barbed wire that's rolled up out in the field, and then the shepherd has to go out and cut them out, and then they'll go back into it. And then finally, you know what a good shepherd does? He'll break their legs. He'll break a leg. Now, not a compound fracture kind of break, but he'll break their legs, and then he'll pick them up and care for them to teach them that they need to follow him and he will guide them, and he will take care of them. And generally, they learn the lesson, and they stay and follow their shepherd. They know his voice. And that's why Jesus says these things. And so they were faint. They were like sheep without a shepherd. 
much like the world which attempts to work for salvation in themselves or in their own goodness. It simply wears them out. I've been around some dear friends that knew that they needed Jesus in their hearts but never had eternal security, and it was all about works, and they wore themselves out because, what, we all sin. And the minute we think we're out of our sin, we get right with God, five minutes later, we're back into it. We're like the sheep getting back in that barbed wire. Uh, but our, our Savior who cares for us has compassion and has worked that out that all we have to do is follow him. But when we don't, we will become weary because we have no strength in ourselves. We can't save ourselves. There is nothing we can do to correct our broken relationship with our Heavenly Father. There's nothing we can do. It's all about what Christ has already done, and all we have to do is receive it. It's free. There are strings attached to almost everything we do as human beings, but that gift of God is absolutely free. Why is it so hard for us to just accept that and receive that free gift of God? But when we try to do it in our own, do it in religion, do it in good works, whatever it might be in our lives, trying to earn our own way to heaven, uh, it can't happen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's about Christ and Christ alone. The world will attempt to work out its salvation, and it will just wear them out. But then he pointed out a problem that the laborers were and are yet today few. Why is that? We love Jesus. And we said, Lord, my life is yours. I bet you every one of us have said that. Lord, my life is yours. Take it and use it as you please. But I'm not going. Believe me, I was kind of there when I, I love Wyoming, though I'm not there originally. And I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere. Please don't send me to Nebraska. And he sent me to Nebraska. But it was five of the most wonderful years I ever had. And the Lord was preparing me to go to the other place that I asked him not to send me, which was Colorado. And I think I'm here in Colorado. And God used that. And these have been the greatest years of my life. Now, are there problems in Colorado? <laughs> you betcha. But you folks have made it so wonderful. God has blessed me so. He moved with compassion in my life as he's moved with compassion in your life. We see in our text as well that he pointed out this problem of the laborers and that they were few. And there were few because there's always hindrances to any harvest. When I worked on the farm, we had all kinds. We had potatoes and beans and barley and oats and wheat and alfalfa and then our small things that we had around us. And every one was difficult. The irrigation, there was always pro problem with the equipment. There was trouble with neighbors. Uh, there was always problems. There were always hindrances uh, with our harvest and with what we were trying to accomplish. It's that way in our normal jobs as well. But it happens that way even for us. And the devil's fighting us. He doesn't want us to send out missionaries. So if nothing else for spite, let's send out more missionaries. And he's going to try and hinder us. He's going to try and hold us back. And he'll remind us, well, you're a lousy Christian. You don't do anything for missions now, and you never will. And you're not this, and you're not that, and you're not a good Christian. And, uh, and we listen to those things, and we heed them. And we think, oh, I'm just so lousy to the point that we don't do anything. He hinders us. We'll let our own concerns about our personal welfare hinder us. Now, we're to be good stewards with what we have, but if God asks you to do something, do it. He'll see that you're taken care of. Uh, as I shared time and again, but a woman had trouble in our church with tithing, and I said, you just for 90 days tithe. And if at the end of 90 days, God won't honor his word, quit tithing. 
And in 30 days, she came up and she, I no longer had to preach on tithing. She went around telling everybody, I have more money now than I ever had. And I'm tithing. And she was just so excited. She was telling everybody. I'm going, amen. This was great. God will honor what he says. That's what's so wonderful about his salvation. He says that we have salvation in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can trust that. We don't have to worry about working it out on our own. There will always be hindrances to every harvest. There will be weeds. There will be lack of water and nutrition, unprepared soil. And spiritually, the same thing uh, happens in our lives from a spiritual aspect. In John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus says, Say not ye that uh, are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. It's interesting. First of all, you got to look up and see there's a harvest. I'm reminded of my son, and matter of fact, then my, my wife reminded me of it the other day. She, we were walking someplace, and she was looking down, and she found a dime. Now, I needed 10 cents to make my 75 cents for my senior coffee, so that worked out really great. But it made me think, she was busy looking down. Had there been a car coming in front of us, she could have gotten hit. My son was that way. He's always looking down. He's finding all kinds of stuff. His pockets were filled. But he was always looking down. And you know, spiritually, we spend a lot of our time just kind of looking down. We don't pay attention to what's up ahead of us. We need to look out and see. And that's what our Mission Emphasis Month is all about, is really to get our attention to saying, let's look out. There's more out there beyond me and mine. And so we see here that we need to look up. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. We have a great harvest in our community, whether it be Westminster, Thornton, Commerce City, Broomfield, Golden, all this area around us. We have people all around us outside this building that need Jesus Christ, and they don't even know it. But if we won't look up, lift up our eyes with compassion, then nothing will happen. Oh, there's homeless people out there. Oh, that's, my heart is broken. Well, what are we doing about it? It's just words. Jesus taught us it's not about words. And there's great urgency. So he said, lift up your eyes that they could uh, not see that the harvest was ready because they were focused on the wrong things, focused on the things of earth and not things above, as it tells us in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 2. They were not willing to see the harvest, let alone take a part in it. God's harvest does not always come after a long period of time. Sometimes it's ready quickly. There are different kinds of corn. There's some corn that takes all summer long and through the fall before it's ready for harvest. And then there's 90-day corn. And there's 60-day corn corn, genetically manufactured or manipulated, however you want to look at it. Uh, but some, So some of those come more quickly than others. And we don't know when it is. So lift up your eyes and see there is a harvest, whether it's the volunteer crop I talked to you about, or whether it's one of these genetically uh, manipulated crops. Uh, we don't know. But if we don't look up, we'll never see it. We'll miss out on the urgency. And we can say, oh, how bad we feel, but we'll never really live the compassion like our Savior has. As we look at these verses, there's something else that we can learn about the harvest. And the first is that urgency. First, he points out that the harvest is plentiful in verse 37. Then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. Well, if God says that it's plenteous, it's plenteous. What does that mean? That really is relational. I think at that time, it was everywhere. Uh, they couldn't help but see it. All they had to do was look up, and it was everywhere their eyes would turn. Uh, in America, we're not seeing the harvest available to us. It's more of a volunteer crop. There was a time that everywhere we looked, people needed to be saved and would get saved. But we've rejected Christ. 
And God has now turned his eyes and his compassion, though he'll still love us, into Africa and the Philippines and Thailand, where people will stand in line to get a gospel tract, to get a New Testament. They want the word of God. They're hungry for the word of God. They know the urgency of it. They know the importance of it. It's true, and yet we don't often pay attention to it. It is plentiful. And he uses the word truly, which is very assertive. It it means indeed. So it is indeed plentiful. The shortage is not found in the harvest. That's what he's saying. It's not the harvest isn't the problem. It's ripe. It's ready for the picking. But the shortage is in the laborers. He compels us to lift up our eyes and see that the harvest is ready and is bountiful. Have you ever tried to count the kernels of a corn? I haven't. I was too busy eating them to count those things. Or of the grains of wheat? Of course not. That seems rather silly. There are too many. And so it is with the Lord's harvest. There are too many to count. We kind of assume because of who we hang out with and we need to hang around with believers, but there is a lost world around us, millions that need Christ. So there is a harvest there to be harvested, but the problem is the laborers. The problem is us. Are we willing to go into those places, into the harvest? That's where the work is at. The hobby church, and I talked about that this morning, doesn't see the intrinsic or the essential inherent value of the harvest, nor do they see the volume. We're not a hobby church. There are many of those around. But we can easily become one if we lose our vision for missions, that the gospel no longer It's only important to us and ours and that we lose our compassion. We must never allow ourselves to become a hobby church. We must see not only the need of the harvest, but that the harvest is indeed plentiful. And it needs men and women willing and ready to labor in the fields of harvest. At harvest time on our farm, It wasn't my farm, I was just a hired hand. But we had to oftentimes, at the harvest, go and bring in extra people to help with the harvest. Well, it's not quite that way for us, but we, in a sense, Pastor Jason and I, when we preach these things, we're trying to invite people into the harvest. Uh, One person can only talk to so many people, but a hundred people can reach a thousand people. We need to all get to a place. See the urgency of the harvest because it is plentiful. We see as well that the harvest is not just plentiful, it's ready. As any crop, when it's ready, when it's ripe, action has to be taken. Had we not gone into our alfalfa field at the right time or into our cornfield or into the potatoes, or into the beans, or into many things that we did, they would have begun to rot in the ground. They would have been of no use to anyone. We couldn't have made money to live on. We couldn't have eaten them of ourselves. And that's what happens when when it's ripe and ready, it needs to be harvested. And there are people that are ready, and yet they sit in their sin waiting for someone to tell them of the great need that they know they have, but don't understand. In John chapter 4, Jesus said that they looked at the harvest futuristically, but he said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20, Jeremiah cried out, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Are those not sad words? There is a time it will be too late. Jesus will come, and the summer will be ended. The harvest will be passed, and there will be many that are not saved. 
And we have to understand that some of that's going to be on us. I don't want it to be that way. Let us send our missionaries. Help them get into the harvest where they're at. Ask the Lord to bring us into the harvest as laborers that we can tell people as they're ready for the harvest. Someone may say, Preacher, you're just crazy. What are you telling me all this stuff for? Well, we have a heart problem. We even love Jesus, but Jesus tells us, if you love me, you finish. Keep my commandments. We are commanded to go into the harvest. It's really not a suggestion. It's a commandment. We need to go to our neighbors, to our families. Every place that God sends us in the Denver metro area and gives us opportunity. Sometimes you can't make an opportunity something uh, just by banging on a door. Uh, sometimes that can work, but many times pray for the opportunity. Then we know it'll work. And God will give us opportunity, but if you don't ask, you may not find. We need the opportunities and we need to pray about it. Many people don't want to hear about Jesus. Many people don't want to go to church. A Gallup poll was taken and over 6 million people were asked, what would it take to get you to church? And the number one answer, someone to ask me to attend. It's that simple. When's the last time you asked someone to come to church? It wasn't preaching the gospel, going to Bible college, any of those things. It was simply, come to church with me. They hear the gospel. But a lot of times what happens is the ground gets prepared by the fellowship, by people coming in and they see that we care about them that we try to meet their needs, and they go, these people are real. They have compassion on me. They care about me, and why should they? And so that when the word of God is preached, their eyes open to the gospel, and they can be saved. We need to ask people. And you say, yeah, well, I, ask, uh, I asked uh, my aunt. Every, every month, I asked my aunt. Okay, well, ask somebody else. Uh, you know, for our, us, our older folks, we have a tendency to ask just old folks. Well, God puts other people in our lives besides old folks. And the young folks, same thing. Well, we just ask people that are like us. Now, ask whoever that God puts in our way. But ask. And we'll see, well, we will get into the harvest. It'll just happen. And so take heed this evening that the harvest is out there. It's ready to be gathered. All we need to do is go out and get it. But we got to go out. We need our heart broken for missions, for souls. And we need to get busy. Instead of just talking about it, we can sit around and talk all we want and sound so spiritual and so pious. But yet, if we won't go ourselves, if we're not willing, it really teaches us how spiritual are we if we can't love the souls that christ loves we got a problem and it's a heart problem and the time is now it's not tomorrow it can be tomorrow but it's right now for someone here today that does not know jesus christ as lord and savior today is the day of your salvation it's today for any one of you that has not been saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, has not received that free gift of God. But yet there are many out all around us that are waiting to be harvested. We need to do it and do it now. Not tomorrow, not later tonight. It's now. This moment, even in this place, at every opportunity God presents us, there are times, I have to be honest with you, there are times I'm ashamed of myself. 
that I am sure that God has given me an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, and I didn't. And I can give a million excuses, and God knows my heart, that's all they were, is excuses. God will give you the opportunity. The opportunity is in front of us. Lift up your eyes and see the opportunity is there now. Let us challenge our own selves to look and then get involved and do it now. We can't do anything about what has taken place in the past, and we have no guarantee of the future. It's only now that's important. In John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me, and you might know this, while it is day. While we can work in the daylight hours, as farmers, that's the only time they used to be able to work. Now they get artificial light, can work 24-7. But while it's day, we need to get busy. The night comes, the time comes when no man can work, when, when there won't be an opportunity for us. When Jesus comes, it'll be too late for those souls that we didn't try to reach. And though our sins have been washed away in the shed blood of Christ, on that judgment day for what we've done, good and bad, in these bodies, Jesus is going to say, what about that person? I've run them, I put them right in your face, and you didn't even invite them to church. How are we going to feel? There are many people looking forward to seeing Jesus. I am in a way, but in a way, no way. I'm afraid he's going to say, why didn't you do this? And I'm going to be so ashamed. I'm going to hang my head. And you know what? Some of you too as well. We need to get into the fight, into the harvest. It's urgent. It's as, it, the urgency is for them, but you know what? The urgency is for us as well. Time is precious. There's only so much of it available to us and others, and therefore it needs to be redeemed or used wisely and presently. In Ephesians 5.16, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The world, the devil, will attempt to keep people from the Lord and us from the harvest. We had a, uh, came through Facebook messaging. We had several of our men went out on Saturday and put out about 90 door hangers, telling people about the Lord, inviting them to church. And through our Facebook messaging, and I don't fully understand it, but a guy goes, I don't know your God, and, uh, and I don't want to see your stuff. And I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember his exact words, but I can see he was very angry. And I don't want this trash on my house or in my neighborhood. And I was reading this going, so what made you the neighborhood police? And I said, and I, in my mind, I'm going, well, why are you bothered if God's not real, if he's just a myth? How can that offend you? But yet, he was all mad. And he essentially was, seemed very threatening in his message about us and what we're doing. But we're not going to stop. He really is just proving our point. We need compassion on that man. He needs to be saved. He really knows that God is real. Or he wouldn't have got upset. His problem is Jesus. And his problem is us for trying to tell him, trying to help him. And we can't let that stop us. The time is now. That's what Jesus is teaching us here, the urgency in his message. The time of the harvest is today, the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. When somebody's ready, we must always be looking all the time to reach that harvest. Paul felt this urgency when he went to Athens. He was to wait for Silas and Timothy. But in Acts 17, verse 16 and 17, it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. You see how Paul, he lifted up his eyes and he saw the idolatry in the whole city. If we're honest, we go out those doors, all you got to do is look up and you can see this an idolatry in our cities, in our area. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. He went to the religious people because they were religious but unsaved. And in the market daily with them 
that met with him. He did something. He had compassion, and he went to them. I can hear Paul saying, I can't wait. I must tell them now. Ask God to give each of us the hearts of the harvest, that we would feel compelled to talk of Jesus and bring in the soul harvest as it's presented to us. If you'll read the rest of Acts 17, you'll find that he had numerous opportunities to share his faith, but he acted upon them. And that's the important thing. Verse 34 says, How be it certain men have clave unto him and believed, among the which was uh, Dionys Dionysus and Arapagite, uh, and the woman named Demaris, and the other with them. The time for reaping a harvest of souls is now. It's the time God has given us. We don't know that we have tomorrow, but we know we have time now. The time of the harvest will end. What's missed is lost and forever. We often get back, can't get back those opportunities. We have an opportunity maybe even yet tonight. And when we give our faith promise missions that others can go now, those that are already in the harvest need our help. They can't do it themselves. Remember I said there are more missionaries coming off the field than going on the field. They need laborers. It's easy to send somebody else, and we need to do that. That's what our mission emphasis is about. But we need to be willing to go. And Jesus will probably say, like he did to that man that the devils were cast out of, no, you just go to your own family, and you tell them all the wonderful things he's done for you. But let him tell you that. Let us not say no to Jesus. God sent me to Nebraska. Then God sent me to Colorado, the two places I didn't want to go. And I'm so glad he did. But we need to be willing to go. We must give to missions now so missionaries can get to the field and stay in the field and be ready to harvest those in their fields. One more thing is that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted or approved by God. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee or helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. And that word accepted means favorable. Now's the favorable time. This is the time. This is the time when God gives you an opportunity. That's the moment that that person needs to hear the gospel. That time, they may not have another moment, another hour, another day. We may have more time. They may not. In America, we have the attitude with material things, I want it and I want it now. Why isn't it that way with spiritual things? Let us have that same attitude for those spiritual things, for the harvesting of souls. We should pray, O oh Lord, give me an opportunity today. If you're not sure of your eternal destiny in this time, to settle it once and forever, do you see the harvest? Do you see that it's plentiful? Do you see the urgency? Then go and give. If you've not received Christ as your Savior and Lord today, if you've not seen your need, then accept him today. We all need him. There may be some of you today that have not received Christ. Oh, I know God, but if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't have God. And he wants you. It's not the will of God that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Make that decision today. There are many laborers here that will show you in the word of God what it takes to be saved. And then you can get in the fight. You can get in the harvest yourself and help us reach souls throughout the world. There is a harvest. There is a need. And we need to recognize the urgency.